Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Dingwall and Stuff Pepper Free Church uh, uh, evening service. And it's great to have you with us in the comfort of your own homes. And we trust and pray that the Lord will bless our time together as we consider what his word has to say to us. We we'll begin our worship by singing to God's praise in Psalm 139a. The Sing Psalms version of Psalm 139 from verse 13 to 18. For you, O Lord, created me. You wove me on your loom. My inmost being you have formed within my mother's womb. And it is interesting how the Lord says, And all the days that I should live, which you ordained for me, were written in your book, O Lord, before they came to be. We'll sing these verses to God's praise, Psalm 139a, For you, O Lord, created me. For you. join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, as we gather around your word this evening, we pray that you would lead us in our minds and our thoughts as we consider what your word is saying to us. We give you thanks that your thoughts are precious and as we scan them from afar as we have sung and as we seek to grasp what your thoughts are, they are wondrous. They are without number. Yet you have shared them with us. And we give you thanks for the word that is the all-powerful word of God, the sharp 
two-edged word of God. And we give you thanks that this word became flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus. And it is the Lord Jesus that we come, uh, in whose name we come this evening. We give you thanks for that name, Jesus. We give you thanks for the Messiah, the Savior, that was prophesied in the Old Testament and in due course and in the fullness of time was born on that byre and came to be the Savior, the man Jesus, who died on that cruel cross in the room and in the place of sinners. And as we make choices in this world, I ask, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us with discernment and with wisdom in making the right, correct choice for ourselves, for our congregations, but most of all, that we would make the right choice for you, that we would choose the Lord Jesus as our hope, as our saviour, as our salvation, that we would choose the scriptures as our means of living according to your word, as our guide to living our lives. We pray that you would help us as believers to take every opportunity we have of sharing this gospel with those with whom we come into contact, those of our colleagues at work, those of our communities, our neighbours, and maybe most difficult of all sometimes, our families, and those who are near and dear to us. Help us to be winsome in our witness. Help us not to be judgmental, recognising that if we are all sinners, we are none of us made perfect, for we have all fallen short of what we would wish to be. And as we consider ourselves, we consider those among us who are struggling at this time, uh, we pray for them. We pray for those who are anxious, those who are burdened. We commend them to you, praying that you would help us to help them where we can, but that you would give them access to the grace that is found in the Lord Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, our minds, our souls. Lead us and guide us in all that's before us, we pray. Remember our parliaments. We remember our governments in Westminster and uh, Edinburgh uh, throughout the United Kingdom. We pray for our Queen, her family. We ask, Lord, that you would remember those who rule over us and uh, mercy that you would show them the way of the truth. So lead us and guide us, we pray. Help us to be a people of discernment and forgive us our shortcomings, our sins. In all these things we ask, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, we're going to consider some passages in God's Word this evening. We're going to read from 1 Samuel and a number of passages that I will read, and then we'll consider what these words might mean to us as we read them in these various passages. And I'm going to read, first of all, from 1 Samuel chapter 8. And this is where the children of Israel request a king. 1 Samuel chapter 8 from verse 5 to 10, and then uh, we look at what these words say to us. Look, that is, the children of Israel said to him, you are now old, and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. And Samuel was displeased with the request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. For it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. And then at verse 18... And when that day comes, that's the day when they have a king, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say, and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. Now I want to consider what that passage says to us. 
about the people of God in the passage. And then I want to apply the principles to the people of God in our 21st century context. We have here the children of Israel. These are the people God has chosen. And God, through the prophets, has been leading them in what we would call a theocracy. God was their king. God was their head. God's way, God's world, God's ideas, God's thoughts were what led and guided these people. God had set down the moral law, the rules that they were following, and this was the way that these people were being ruled. But we have a situation here where Samuel's sons had taken over the reins from Samuel and they weren't doing very well. They weren't honorable and they were taking advantage. So the people had become unhappy. And there's a warning here for any who are in leadership in God's church. We cannot overlord it on people. We cannot be like these sons of Samuel were. They accepted bribes. They perverted justice. In other words, they had forsaken God's way. And the people said to Samuel, look, you know old, your sons aren't like you. Give us a king to judge us like all other nations have. And that sounds sensible. That sounds reasonable. Well, if God's representatives are not doing very well, well, let's find our own. It sounds sensible. But look at what it says in verse 7. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They no longer want me to be their king. And this is something totally different. This is something that God is explaining to Samuel because he had discerned in the children of Israel a desire to follow the way of the world. So they wanted somebody so that they could be like other nations. And you ask yourself, why would they want to be like other nations? Yes, we can see that Samuel's sons weren't doing very well, but they were people. They were people that they'd seen grow up. They still had Samuel. And their memories would have been long enough to remember what God had done for the children of Israel. Because the Jews were very up on their history. They knew about Abraham. They knew about the Exodus. They knew about how God had dealt with their enemies in times past. Yet, they wanted rid of God and they wanted to put a king, a man, in his place. The institution of a king was something they knew and recognized. And they wanted that for themselves. Now Samuel wasn't happy. Samuel wanted to retain the theocracy. They knew that Samuel wanted to have God as our leader, as our king. And God was recognizing that their hearts had turned away from him and were looking to the ways of this world. And I think that's a very real danger for us in our 21st century. Because God's way is the way of Scripture. And when we have Scripture telling us things, it's not right or in our remit to change what God's Word says. When it comes to the principles of life that we have in the Bible, that is God's word. And it's God's inerrant word. And although we're in the Old Testament today, and looking at this passage in the Old Testament this evening, we're recognizing within this passage the thread of the gospel message right through it, the promise of Jesus right throughout the Old Testament, through to the culmination and fulfillment of all these prophecies in the New Testament. And we have before us the Word of God. And if there's one thing we must be wary of in a 21st century congregation, in a 21st century world, is 
the way that the world wants to influence the way the church is run. Because we have policies, guidelines coming out of government that is totally again and against the way of God. The Bible speaks of gender. The Bible speaks about Adam being born a man, or being created a man, I should say. And the Bible speaks of people being born male and female, because that is how God created us. So there are things in the scripture that are black and white. And we cannot compromise the scripture just because the world is saying one thing that is totally opposite to what the Lord is saying. And there's a warning coming from God. You want a king? Well, you look at what happens when a king comes into play. He will take from you. You will take your men and you will go to war. And he will be a man with all the weaknesses of other men. But isn't it interesting, even though Samuel, the faithful prophet of God, is speaking to them and saying, don't do this. Be careful. Don't do this. The people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, all these things you've said, no matter, we still want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. And that's what the people wanted. And God, and God said to Samuel, do as they say, give them a king. And so it was that they were looking for a king. And in chapter 9 of Samuel, we see there that the Lord told Samuel the previous day, about this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to be the leader of my people Israel. He will rescue them from the Philistines. For I have looked down on my people in mercy and have heard their cry. And Samuel was pointed in the direction of Saul. Pointed in the direction of Saul because he was going to be their new king. And Saul was the first king of Israel. God had heard the people want a king. So God said, Let's give them a king. He was chosen by God and by the people. And Saul was head and shoulders above the rest from the tribe of Benjamin. But he was head and shoulders above the rest. He was an impressive looking individual. So he fit the bill, didn't he? He looked good. And he was the man that... God said, well, you have him as your king. He looks the part. He's what you want, isn't he? But Saul was flawed, wasn't he? He failed because he lacked confidence in himself. And more crucially, he lacked confidence in God. He was very complex. And sometimes we can feel sorry for him. He was in a situation that was difficult, and sometimes, because of his own weakness, because of his own failures, he failed. And he failed, and he was hard on the people around him. But the people were happy on, up with him because he looked the part. So here we have God's people turning away from God, turning away from the people uh, that God had uh, as his representative, Samuel, and the, the poor record of Samuel's sons. So then we turned to 1 Samuel 16, where we have the Lord saying to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. I'll take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. 
I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. That's the oldest son. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemiah, but Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? Oh, they're still the youngest, Jesse replied. And he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. And some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. And one of the servants said to him, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he's a brave warrior, a man of war and has good judgment. He's also a fine looking young man and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and a wineskin full of wine. <clears throat> so David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better and the tormenting spirit would go away. So we have here now a very clear lesson from the Lord himself. We have the people in the first instance wanting a king like other nations. They wanted to be like the rest of the world. We had seen a man who looked the part but was flawed. And his character and the flaws in it were obvious, began to become an issue. And so now we have God's chosen one, God's anointed one, David. And isn't it interesting when we read this passage and we start reading about the man David, how, first of all, they all thought, well, it'll be the oldest, the tallest, or whatever. But it's the youngest, the one that looks to be the least of the sons that was chosen. But as God said to him, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this is what God is teaching us even today because there's a principle here and a concept here that does not change because the Bible teaches us God is unchanging. So when God looks at you, he doesn't look at your appearance. He doesn't look at your physicality. It may be mentioned, it may be of significance, 
but of primary importance to God is your heart. And what's of primary significance to God in his people are their hearts. And he's saying about Eliab, don't judge him by his appearance. I have rejected him. Why? Because I have looked at his heart. And when God looks at his heart, he recognizes something in David. And what was in David? Well, there was a commitment there. There was a commitment to the role that he was entrusted with. When we see later on uh, David speaking about his work with the sheep, he was there as the guard, as the shepherd of the sheep and the goats. And because he took that job seriously, because he took the responsibility seriously, when a bear came in to threaten the sheep, he grabbed it by his jaws and slew that bear. When a lion came and threatened the sheep, he grabbed that lion and slew that lion. Why? Because he was committed to the guardianship of the sheep. He was committed to looking after the flock. Of God. And when we have an image of David the shepherd, we have an image that we can commend to others. We see in the sons of Samuel failure and selfishness and greed and worldliness entering in to a holy priest's office, which is not something that should have ever happened. Why? Because they had looked away from God. And they were only interested in themselves. They were self-serving. And isn't it interesting, when we consider pastors, when we consider a new minister, we should be looking at their character. We should be looking at them and to what we know of them. And I know it's a difficult thing to make a discernment based on watching somebody preach online or from uh, a distance without getting to meet them. But we should be able to discern from their preaching the seal they have for souls. We should be able to recognize in an individual who shares God's word an interest in the people that he has before him. Because we should recognize that when preachers speak, they speak to the people in front of them. As I'm speaking to you here this evening, you need to know I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Lord. Because that is what the Lord has asked me to do this evening. Speak to you from his word. Because God has given me this passage that I have to speak to you about. So when we consider a preacher, we consider one who takes God's word as God has given it to him and shares it with you. So when you discern a preacher that you feel the Lord is leading you, consider what God is saying to you, the way that Samuel considered God's word to him. Don't judge by his appearance. Don't judge by his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. And this is the one that I want for you. Anoint him. This was God's instruction to Samuel. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now let's take that principle that we have here in 1 Samuel and apply it to Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church in our 21st century. We are here trying to discern God's will for us. We are here trying to discern whom God has set aside to be our pastor, to be our minister. So what we have to do is emulate what Samuel did here. Because Samuel was listening to God's voice for instruction. Samuel was wanting to know 
and to discern God's choice as king. Now, we see that God said, give them Saul. He looks the part. And isn't it interesting? Because he looked the part, the people thought, great. They looked at him, head and shoulders above the rest. But when they came to anoint him, he couldn't be found. Where was Saul found? And this is a man who had had a victory already, had done some good work. But when they came to anoint him, where was Saul to be found? Hiding in amongst the baggage. Still they went with him. But there's a principle to be applied here. Samuel was listening to God's voice. So let's consider what that means to you, a member in Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church. And it also applies to believers wherever you are in the world. Although I might be speaking directly to the membership of this congregation, I'm speaking to members and to Christians all over the world. When we discern what God's will for us is, we have to listen and hear and find God's voice speaking to us through our study of the Scripture and through our prayers. Because we have here Samuel discerning God's will God's choice. This is the man. Put God first. Because why is it that we're looking for a minister? Where we're looking for a man to preach the gospel, to teach the word, and we want to see an interest in the people in that person that we want to uh, elect as our minister. But we want him to put God first. And we want to be discerning. We might want to review how he's performed in the past. Where has he been elsewhere? And has he developed that passion for Christ amongst his people? So that his people have that interest. As we heard this morning in the woman of Samaria, she not only had a passion for what she'd heard, she had a genuine excitement about her to go forward and to go forth amongst her communion to share the news that she'd got. So we want a pastor who is excited about the, the, the gospel message and who is obviously driven because he wants souls to come to the Lord. And that's critical. That's crucial. That is emphatic. Not like Saul, who was out for himself, Not like the sons of Samuel who were selfish and out for themselves. We must be discerning. When a man preaches, he preaches for Christ, not for himself. Because if we look at ourselves as preachers, we are no better than you are. We are flawed. We are sinners. So if you're looking for perfection, well, you won't find it this side of eternity. We will never, ever, ever find a perfect man because he lived 33 years and then he was crucified on that cross and he now sits at the right hand of the Father and he is the one who sent his spirit to lead us and to guide us. So as we consider our choice, listen, to what God is saying to you. And the principle I want to share with you here is this. Your discernment is a spiritual discernment based upon your prayers and based upon your desire. And your desire of necessity must be this, the extension of God's kingdom. And what that means is we must, as a congregation, wish for more people in our community to come to know the Lord Jesus. And that means we are like the woman at the well. We must be willing to share that good news, to share Jesus with the people in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. And that's not easy. But our minister must be one who can encourage us and can gather us, and lead us, and guide us, and protect his flock. 
And we as elders must be there discerning and supportive and assisting him in that task. So if you see us as elders not doing these things, well, you can criticize us. You can challenge us. Because that's our role also as leaders to lead you and guide you at this time as we try to find a minister that God has chosen for us. But let's go back to this principle of God's leading. So I commend you to pray as individual members, as individual adherents, as boys and girls in this congregation. Pray this prayer. Lord, lead us. Lead me. Guide me in finding the man of your choice. Lead me and guide me in finding the man of your choice. Because we have two sides of the coin here. We've got God and God's choice discerning. And we have ourselves trying to find out God's choice. And how can we find out what God wants for us other than speaking to him? And if we have faith, and if we have trust, like Samuel did, he heard and listened out for God's voice and heard it. And he listened to it and obeyed it. And the way this will work, and the way that calls have traditionally happened in the free church, is that we discern God's voice as individuals. And we think, well, what is it that we need and then we prayerfully commit this and commend this in prayer to the Lord. And the Lord will guide you. Because the Lord does not trip you up. He doesn't fool you. He doesn't lead you on. And what the Lord has promised us is that he will be with us. We even read in the psalm that God's thoughts are so numerous, but he helps us to discern them. He helps us to understand them. So the way this will work is if we prayerfully commit everything to God spiritually and in faith, in trust and in dependence, he will lead us to the man of his choice. And if we are truly selfless, don't think about what I want. Don't think about what the world wants. What does God want? So you ask God, what do you want for this congregation? And if you want this man, tell me that you want this man to be our minister. Because God will not tell you lies. And if we truly ask that prayer right, in the correct way, we will all come to a conclusion as to the man of God's choice. And God will answer your prayer. So don't think the way the world thinks. Don't go for this fellow because, oh, he's been bad here or bad. Discern God's will. Take into account everything you know, yes. Take into account everything you've heard, possibly, if it's verified. But don't listen to rumor. Don't listen to conjecture. Don't listen to gossip. If somebody says something negative, be sure that what you've heard is verifiable. Don't listen to somebody's opinion that's not based or founded upon truth. Now, when it comes down to it, it's between you and God. Because you have a choice to make. And it's a big choice. It's an important choice. God gave the children of Israel the choice of a king. And they made the wrong choice. And we can see that God said, well, choose this man. This was God's choice. He knew it was the wrong choice, but he was following the will of what people wanted. But God gave them their way. And then when we go through and read what we have here in David, 
where David, in uh, chapter 17, is sent out by his father to go and give his brother sustenance. So in 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 21 to 26, 29 to 40, and 45 to 52, we have these words. Soon the Israelites and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. And this is King Saul, the man, leading God's children, the children of Israel, in battle against another army led by another man. In other words, they've left God out. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, this is the big fellow, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out every day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him, and he will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. Note, God's words are coming through here. They're already paying taxes, but this man needs another man to beat this champion. They're looking at the way of men, human Philosophies at play here. Whereas before, they could have depended on God, the King of Kings, the Creator of heaven and earth. Oh no, we want a man. David asked the soldier standing nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway, and that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? David can't believe that. God's people are letting this man defy God. They're letting this man thrash God's name. And David is incensed by this. David cannot believe that the army of God, the God of gods, the King of kings, is being held and bowed and cowed by a Philistine. So he's a big fellow, but he's not God. Ah, but he's bigger than anyone in our army. But he's not God. And then he goes up to his brothers, and his brothers look to him and says, what are you doing here, young fellow? Why don't you go go back to your own sheep? And, And David asked, what have I done now, David replied? I was only asking a question. And you can see, you know, David is God's choice, and the brothers maybe aren't happy about it because you're the youngest and you're only a shepherd. We're in the army here. We're soldiers. You're a shepherd. And what are you doing here anyway? Go back to your sheep. David's question was reported to King Saul. And King Saul sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go and fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war ever since his youth. Now, there's an important point to be made here. God looks at the heart. But we always look at the externals. It's easier for us to do that. And sometimes we can only really discern somebody as we get to know them. And what has been difficult in our circumstance is discerning and getting to know somebody at a distance getting to know a potential minister because we can't meet him. We can't chat to him over a cup of coffee. But is that going to stop us finding God's choice? God's in heaven and he's with us now. God's in heaven and he's in your mind and in your heart if you're a believer. Is he going to stop speaking to you just because of COVID? No. Gath maybe produce this giant. He might stop the armies of God, but he won't stop God. So I'm asking you, this giant that we call COVID-19, is this going to stop us discerning God's man for us? Well, look at David. This COVID-19 giant isn't going to cow us. Why? Because God is God is God. And he tells you what you want or what you need to know. 
if you ask him. So I'm asking you to ask him. God, here we are, we're cowed by this giant COVID. Should we not approach and look at COVID the same way David looked at Goliath? Because COVID will not defeat us. Why? Because God is on our side. Don't worry about who can uh, uh, kill your body or your physicality or your physical sense. Worry about the one who can destroy your soul and your body. That is Think about God. Worry about the judgment that comes to you if you don't believe in the Lord. So we look to God to answer our question. Put God first. Have the same faith in God in tackling COVID and in tackling this big question about Dingwall and South Pepper Minister. Who do we choose? Let's go to God. He will answer your question. But look at what Samuel did. He listened to God. And listen to what God said to Samuel. Don't look on the outside. Look on the inside. So that's why we must be discerning in relation to what a minister brings. A zeal for souls. A track record in reaching out. A genuine interest. But who is God's man for us? Let's ask him. David said, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. And when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. That's what I do. I'm a shepherd. I look after my sheep. If I have done this both to lions and bears, I'll do it for this pagan Palestine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. Okay, go ahead, and may the Lord be with you. And Saul gave David his own armor bearer, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. God saw the heart of David. He wasn't a faint heart. And there's a confidence in God's called men. There's a confidence that doesn't rest in them. David didn't rest in him and his ability. His confidence was in the Lord Jesus. His confidence was in God himself. And from our standpoint, our confidence is in the Lord Jesus. So David was given armor and he took it on, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. He was given the armor of the, of, of, of the army, if you like, the human accoutrements of war, and he couldn't handle it. He was given armor that was too big for him, too heavy. He couldn't even walk. He says, I'm not used to them. David took them off. So what did he do? Verse 40, chapter uh, uh, 17. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. He had a shepherd's staff and a sling and five stones. But that's not all he had. He had God on his side. He had a relationship with God that was real. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. A preacher of the word of God stands before his congregation, before the world, and is willing to preach. He is standing before the challenge of Goliath and says, the God whom you have defied is with me. 
And we are looking for a man who is able to stand up and defy the philosophy of our 21st century world. The regulations, the legislation of our land that is so again and against the word of God. We want a man who is willing to stand up and be counted on God's side. Who will look after you. Who will encourage you. Who will challenge you. And who will motivate you? Who will mobilize you? Jesus spoke to that woman at the well this morning. And she was invigorated. She was challenged. But she obeyed. And in faith spoke of Jesus to others. And then verse 47 in chapter uh, 17. Everybody assembled then, he says, this is David speaking to Goliath, will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. This is God's battle. And he will give you to us. And as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. David was not cowed. He ran towards danger. He ran towards Goliath. And reaching into his shepherd's bag, he took out a stone. He hurled it with a sling and hit the Philistine smack in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only sling and stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that the champion was dead, they turned and ran. And then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all over the road from Shireim and as far as Gath. And Ekron. David might have been the instrument of disaster for the Philistines, but the victory is God's. We might be the instruments of God's church in Dingwall, Stothpeffer, Conan Bridge, the Black Isle, Achnashin, Loch Luchard, wherever. But it is God who is with us. And what I commend you to do is, what Samuel did, what David did, rely on God, pray to him for a clear vision of the man of his choosing. We're searching for God's chosen one. Don't do it the way the world does it. Don't look only on the externals. Be discerning and therefore speak to God about it. We're searching for a chosen man, chosen by God. Speak to God, earnestly ask him to show you his mind, his will. Notice I said his mind, God's mind, his will, God's will. And carefully discern what God's will for us in this congregation is. And if we are a prayerful people, God won't fool us. And if we commend one another to God in prayer, if we commend this congregation as a congregation to God in prayer, and if we ask that same question, Lord, guide us to the man of your choice, he will do it. If that is our prayer, guide us, Lord, to the man of your choice. He will lead us there. He will not trick us. He will not fool us. He will not send us down a blind alley. And the beautiful thing about our God is, he's in our hearts, in our minds. The same God in my heart, in my mind, is the same God that's in your heart, in your mind. And 
speak to that same God and he's the one who will convince us. He's the one who will lead us. And what God says is that if we obey him, if we are obedient to him, and if we trust him, we will all come with discernment and spiritual discernment to the man of God's choice. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the principle of leadership that Samuel showed us. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to live according to your word and help us to discern your will for us. Help us to pray that prayer. Lead us to a man of your choice, your choosing for our congregation, so that we can say that when we have chosen a man, this was a man that you spoke to us about, that you led us to, that you guided us to. Forgive us our shortcomings, forgive us our selfishness, and help us to discern when we follow a worldly path. Help us to do all to your own glory. Help us to do this in a way that is clear and open and in a way that is for you and for you alone. For although we need it for ourselves, it is for your glory we want this. So we want the right man, the man that you have chosen for us now, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we're going to close by singing the hymn Jerusalem. Uh, the hymn that speaks of God's chosen for us, the Lord Jesus. See him in Jerusalem, walking where the crowds are. Once these streets had sung to him, now they cry for murder. How fickle the world is. The world that looked to Jesus as the celebrity of his day, the healer of the sick, the raiser of the dead. Such a frail and lonely man carrying a cruel and heavy cross. See him walking in Jerusalem. Why? To save us. The king who made the sun, the moon, and the shining stars, let the soldiers hold and nail him down. These soldiers were created by him, and he let them hold him. He let them nail his hands and feet to that cross. Why? So that he could save them. And then, as he hung there on the cross, he offered his life. He gave up his spirit, now no longer breathing. Dust that formed the watching crowds takes the blood of Jesus. And the earth shakes because it recognizes what's happened. Creation itself trembles before the death of Jesus. Feel the earth is shaking now. The veil, the veil of the Holy of Holies is split in two. And he stood before the wrath of God, shielding sinners with his blood. And why have we got confidence in this Savior, this dead Savior who died on that cross? Well, I can tell you why. Because he is not dead. He is resurrected. He is in heaven today. See the empty tomb today. Death could not contain him. Once the servant of the world, now in victory reigning. The victory of David pales into insignificance compared to the victory of Jesus. And that's the victory you have in the Lord Jesus. And that's the victory you have if you believe in the Lord, wherever you are in the world. So lift your voices to the one who is seated on the throne. See him in the new Jerusalem. Praise the one who saves us. Lift your voices to Jesus. So we'll sing this to God's praise. See him in Jerusalem, walking where the crowds are. Now they
Let us pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.